Welcome to Sports Performance Radio. I'm your host, B. Chavez, and I'd like to thank everyone for being here with me today. Um, this is a kind of an exciting show. It's our uh, second one. I uh, want to thank everyone for the uh, response and the, and the uh, just the success of the first episode. Um, a lot of uh, technical issues and trials and tribulations to get that to you, and it was a giant learning curve. That's one of the reasons I titled it the uh, prototype episode. But uh, I still want to thank everyone for coming along and uh, making it a success and kind of showing me the things that I need to improve to make this show as, in, in general, a success in the future. So today's, today's show I'm really excited about. I've got a great guest. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, as kind of I illustrated early on, I want to just kind of touch on a little new couple of news stories. And uh, this time I really only found one, but it's exciting. It's an interesting story. Uh, I think that everyone out there will be interested, and uh, it, it may even shape things to come. And I'm just going to read the headline. Uh, I found this um, one of the uh, pharmacology sites I follow. And the headline is, and I quote, Researchers at an Australian racing forensic laboratory have discovered a new designer steroid. Capsules were confiscated by government authorities in Queensland and found to contain a previously unknown steroid. That steroid is 3-chloro-17-alpha-methyl-5-alpha-androstan. Um, you could drive, drive that down as shorthand to 3-chloro-methyl-DHT, which uh, sounds like probably like a lot of gibberish to the average person. In chemistry terms, uh, the closest thing I could think of that might be like is uh, that's a halotin ring. So that would be something like a halotinated masteron. Uh, it's kind of a, a halogenated DHT derivative. That is very interesting in itself. The, uh, the article goes on to say, uh, and I quote, there are no patents nor scientific articles in reference to this sub substance in official channels, uh, meaning that this is very possibly a truly innovative compound. It means that someone went out of their way to create this. Uh, that in itself speaks volumes. It's... Uh, it means that somewhere out there, there's a very sophisticated lab doing some very sophisticated work, just not necessarily in the manufacture of this compound, which is, is mildly complicated, but the manufacture uh, pales in comparison to the engineering. Someone actually had to create this. Someone with such a, a you know staggering and, and kind of corporate style uh, chemical engineering background actually sat down and created this compound on paper, modeled it, and then figured out how to derive it, and then figured out how to derive it in sufficient quantities to be usable. So this is um, really interesting. I find it interesting that it happened in Australia. I can't say that I personally knew that the uh, the underground and uh, uh, the, the uh, sophistication existed in the Australian underground for a compound like this. Uh, it could be just coincidence that it happened there, or it could be that there's just uh, a very robust uh, community there that I'm not aware of. But it's very, very interesting that it exists. It's very ex interesting that it happened in Australia. Um, I will say this, and this is purely speculative, but it's my experience that uh, compounds of this nature tend to have siblings. There tends to be two, three, four very related and similar compounds. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if whoever made this also made a number of very similarly related compounds. So it'll be interesting to see if they turn up and, um, you know, if they're ever tested for or even truly identified. So it's a very interesting subject, and it, it's a very interesting news point, and I think uh, we'll probably be hearing more about this in the future. So something to keep your eyes open for, not necessarily for a run out and, ooh, I need to buy that, but it's very interesting to see how this is shaping athletics. Uh, typically, uh, it's my experience that these sorts of things find their way into track and field. Uh, typically, oral drugs are... Uh, you know, used in that sort of realm because they can be stopped, discontinued for testing. And in this case, it's a drug that no one would ever have a suspicion to test for. So very interesting stuff there. Very, very exciting uh, from an intellectual point of view. I don't think it's going to have much impact on the day-to-day -day gym goer, but it's interesting that, that athletics are sh shaping up in this fashion and we may have a new, uh, a new clandestine Balco out there, which... Um, you know, like it or not, did shape athletics through the uh, 90s and 2000s and uh, was quite the new story. So 
Again, very interesting to see where that goes. But on to the show. The show. My show. Very exciting. Uh, every time I even say my show, I get goosebumps. I get a shiver. And this one is is beyond reproach. I have a gentleman that we're going to talk to on the phone in just a few moments that uh, I was previously unaware of. I did not know who this individual was. Uh, I was uh, directed to some of his material. He is a published author. He is uh, competitive and strong man in powerlifting. And I was just absolutely positively knocked over. I could not believe um, the, the, just the magnitude, the eruption of information that came from the, this guy. This guy just knocked me over. Um, he is literally only in his fourth year at Springfield College achieving a degree in applied exercise science. I have no doubt that he will go on to master's and PhDs and even beyond that. Um, I'm sure some of you out there are raising an eyebrow right now because you know me and my uh, general paradigm. I tend not to elevate academic success very much. I tend not to use that as the metric as to whether or not someone's competent or worth talking to. But I can say that in rare occasions, when a competent athlete is a competent or, in this case, extremely competent intellect, uh, it makes an extraordinary combination. It makes something that you just can't get elsewhere. To find someone that understands the science and understands how it is being applied and how it should be applied to the world of athletics is truly where the magic happens. It's where the, quote, rubber meets the road. And this guy, this guy is that guy. I have no doubt in another five or ten years, this will be the name. You won't remember Pullican and all of these other, the Simmons and all these other imbeciles that really have nothing genuine or new to offer. You will be hearing this guy's name. And that name is Andrew Triana. This guy is truly amazing. So enough hype, enough, uh, enough wind blowing. We'll get Andrew on the phone. I'll let him impress you, but I want to warn you, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, put down whatever's in your hands right now, get a notepad, get a pencil, and be prepared to just be blown away. All right, everybody, as promised, we are here live on the phone with somebody that I really, really think is the future of strength training. Here we have Andrew Triana. Andrew, say hello. Hello, everyone. Nice to be talking to you. It's an honor to be on the show here with B, and uh, hopefully we can help you out with some pretty solid information. All right, Andrew. You, uh, as we talked a little bit off the air, you have some really great training ideas on a, on a topic that I'm betting most of our listeners, most of my listeners, simply don't even know exists, and that is the concept of training specifically for the energy system requirements of your sport. And uh, I really think that, as technical as that sounds, that's simple enough to let you just just impress and, uh, and and just blow us away with what we should be doing. Absolutely. So, again, just thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I want to be clear that when I speak about energy systems and autonomics, that we're all – we all have access to the same science. So, of course, this is my lens and my perspective on how I view these topics and how I apply them directly into a training template. So uh, I'm going to begin with defining autonomics and energy systems on a strength athlete level for you. So the autonomic nervous system is a branch of the central nervous system that includes the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches. These are going to apply hugely to your training. So first, the sympathetic branch is essentially what training is. Training is a program stress that elevates the heart rate, that excites the neurons, that activates the muscles. It's a very high energy, high expenditure uh, activity. And that is going to fall under reign of the sympathetic nervous system. So the heart with no neural input is 100 beats per minute. So essentially, anytime your heart rate is going over that uh, 90 to 100 beat per minute threshold, you're in a sympathetic state that means uh, essentially you're catabolizing glycogen and other substrates that you have in your muscles for energy. And this energy is going to give you the extra kick you need to perform the activities at hand uh, with prowess. 
Conversely, the par- the parasympathetic system is going to do the opposite. It is going to help you relax. It is going to help you recover. It's going to be the nervous system that dictates your heart most of the day. So, again, anytime it's under 100, it means you have some form of a parasympathetic tone on the heart and the body. So this is going to be optimal because if all day you're catabolizing energy and all day you're breaking things down, then what energy are you going to have to train? What energy are you going to have to respond to stress? That is the nervous system that you tap into to respond to big tasks. If you have a big final, every time someone walks into a final, they're a little bit sweaty, their heart's beating a little faster than normal because they know what's in front of them matters. So that is a very common way to determine uh, the neural input in the activity that you're doing. If it's something that excites you, if it's something that gets you out of that normal, everyday haze, that's that, something that's going to cause stress in some way, shape, or form. So what you're saying is a state of arousal and above. Absolutely. Okay, so a state of arousal and above become specialized energy systems, and the other um, would almost be uh, considered like cruise control. Absolutely. That's a great way to think about it because okay. uh, you're going to be in a constant state of trying to keep the body up to par. So if you were just coming off a very tough training session and you create a lot of damage, this parasympathetic system is going to help smooth out the damage that you did over time. And it's going to be a process that doesn't last just that post-workout window where you drink your protein shake. This is going to last 24 to 36 hours regardless of how hard your training was. There's going to be some type of recovery going on for that period of time. Okay. So, so the next... Us through. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. I, I didn't mean to speak over you. I do apologize. Continue. Oh, next, I was just going to relate uh, that into the specific energy systems because autonomics ultimately do dictate what's going on with the energy systems. So uh, from here on out, I'm going to be speaking specifically for the strength athlete because as... Uh, you all know strength athletics are different than most other athletics. It kind of favors one trait, and you kind of just have to dominate that one or two traits. It's not like other sports where there's multiple kinds of activity, like soccer, where there's running. Strength athletics are very specific. So the three energy systems that the human body can primarily use for activity are going to be the aerobic system, which is... uh, supplied by fat stores and longer chain molecules of energy, Uh, the glycolytic system, which is going to function mainly on glucose, and the phosphagen system, which is going to function mainly on ATP and creatine phosphates. The electron transfer system, that that third one. Absolutely. So all these are intertwined, but they do have clear definitive differences. Now, so, are you approaching them as a cascade type scenario, or are you literally compartmentalizing them in in this, this kind of training model? Uh, no, they're not like they're not necessarily linked to each other. Uh, it doesn't go like one exercise doesn't go through everything. Things can absolutely be specialized. I'm just identifying that there are three different chains or three different uh, areas that an activity could fall into. Excellent. Okay. So specifically. Uh, for the strength athlete, the aerobic energy system is going to be different. Whether it's powerlifting or strongman or Olympic lifting, aerobic for us is very different than what aerobic would be for a marathon runner. Aerobic for us is going to be one to two minutes of activity because anything beyond that isn't necessarily going to carry over as well or be as efficient as it could be. I'll get into more of that later. But there is a different aerobic need for the strength athlete. I'm not saying anything else is wrong, but I'm just saying it's different. And you would uh, define it for a different athlete. And then that is going to travel down uh, the other energy systems that's going to affect those as well. The glycolytic energy system, which functions mainly on glucose, is going to be very important in a way that isn't directly important to the sport. So now that's going to make a lot more sense in a little bit. Then finally, the phosphagen system is going to be the main powerhouse for the activity you'll be performing as a strength athlete. However, when you go into building these systems, that's when things get a little tricky because then the glycolytic system and the aerobic system then will start affecting the phosphagen system. 
Now, when you say building these systems, you are literally, I'm correct in assuming you're referring to erecting approved improvements in the performance of these individual systems. Yep. So each system can have a different capacity. They're okay. not by any means the same because your aerobic system is high, your uh, phosphogen system can be weak and vice versa, and any mixture of the two. So, uh, for example, if a marathon runner was put on a field, a football field, with a football player, and uh, the football player, assuming being highly trained at like a collegiate level, would most likely outperform in the 10-yard sprint the marathon runner. Now, it won't be time. The best way to measure the phosphogen system's efficiency is the maintenance of top speed. So let's say I have a couple of trials we determined that the football player's top, top speed was during the 10-yard sprint where he was at 7.2 seconds. We'll just say that for, uh, as a reference point. Okay. A measure of his phosphogen system would be how many times he can maintain 7.2 before we see a drop-off. Now, that top speed can be different than the marathon runner, which would make it harder to measure them equally. But when you look at the 10-yard sprints, like I said, how many times you can maintain his top speed, that gives us a more unbiased view of their phosphogen system. Does so basically, you're, you're measuring that performance of that energy system as in, to turn it into terms that maybe listeners would immediately understand is um, doing 10 sets of three without a measurable drop-off is a, a good representation of that or, or, or a specific energy system. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So and then you a can... commensurate athlete might only fare seven or eight sets of three before seeing a drop off in performance or torque output. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, there are different ways to measure the energy system's efficiency other than just weightlifting. So now it almost sounds, and, I, and I'm going a little off topic here, but I, 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 I love these kinds of little opportunities. It sounds as if there's almost perhaps other ways than the standard convention to measure general fitness. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's just my little little pick at the, at the greater community. <laughs> Please continue and ignore my sarcasm. No, of course. Well, I just want to address that uh, really quick because you, I'm sure, more than anybody else coming from a heavy science background, you can't just ask necessarily broad questions. What are you testing? I can generally test the fitness of something about you, but I can't necessarily test all of the fitness or your fitness level of all of these energy systems at once or with one test. So now, it's really on, what are you testing? I fully convinced the universe that you can approve every aspect of everything simultaneously. Yeah, you're right. I mean, because <laughs> uh, those skills transfer so well. But that's a conversation right. for a different time. Indeed. So now, is. Please continue, and I will stop interrupting. No problem. So now the reason I define the energy systems and the autonomic systems separately is for you to understand them unbiasedly on your own because now is where I'm going to begin intertwining them and drawing connections between the two. So now, like I said, strength athletics are mainly a phosphogen-based sport. So it just so happens that phosphogen-based activity really has a profound effect on spiking the sympathetic nervous system. Now, this is because to produce maximum force or a very high amount of force, which is what the phosphogen system is capable of or responsible for, you need a lot of recruitment. You need a lot of the body to work together at once to produce that. You can't produce a high amount of force walking on the street randomly, right? Like whenever you hit a max lift, you're warmed up. Uh, everything's firing on all cylinders. And this is where the sympathetic nervous system comes to play, and this is especially why it's important to have a healthy balance of uh, autonomically for a strength athlete because to get that biggest PR, you need to be as sympathetic as possible to really make sure everything's cooperating. So there is a, uh, a very important and profound link for strength athletes training in their energy system, but that's nothing groundbreaking. Everyone knows that if you want to get stronger, you got to train hard within a certain rep range, and it's nothing crazy. Like, it's a almost quantitative, unargued way to get stronger. If you do heavy sets of five, you're going to get stronger. That's not new. But what I am trying to open a lot of people's eyes to are the link between the aerobic energy system, like I said, for strength athletes, 
and the parasympathetic nervous system. So uh, a lot of people will agree that the more frequently you can train, you can hit a muscle group, the more frequently you can get in the gym and actually do something productive, ultimately the greater progress you should make. So now if there was a way that in your training you could improve your ability to recover, that would be great. So that's the link I want to draw between the aerobic energy system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So okay. I do want to throw in some uh, maybe different language because – um, I mean, even between just you and I, you have a vast uh, academic background, and I, I have an academic background, possibly not on par with your own, but um, just the difference in the generational difference, I hear a lot of language differences. Um, and one of the things I want to throw out here is, in, in my realm where you're talking about, uh, you know, the states of arousal and, and how you need to be warmed up, to, in, in my time that would have been very heavily underscored with uh, – elevated choline levels. That was a, a, an adrenaline-based scenario. Absolutely. Catecholamines are actually the driving force behind the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. What I think happens that's a, is, a very important point to hammer is, you know, if you're excited, if you're in that fight, fight or flight kind of scenario, that's where you're talking now. Yep, absolutely. That okay. is really the home for the sympathetic nervous system. I was going to talk about catecholamines more in the nutrition, but it was certainly going to get hit. But that is something that we should drive home, you're right. Catecholamines are a series of ligands uh, produced in the human body, and they're essentially adrenaline, and their job is to break down energy stores to rapidly uh, put energy into the bloodstream for usage. Uh, these are your uh, seen in caffeine, methamphetamines, anything like that. Sympathetic drugs uh, tend to act similarly, and that is where their fat burning quality actually comes from, because their job is to liberate energy. And guess what's a great store of energy? Fat. Right. So, so um, that's where their free fatty acids from stores, putting them in the bloodstream. Absolutely. Okay. So if you were an animal in the to, wild, I just wanted to cover that so that there was no language gap between you know people of different you know eras or or, or mindsets. Of course, excuse me, and not being uh, as no, open no, as no, you're you're, <laughs> No, you're, you're, you, you have the same flaw that I have, is that you assume everyone's on your page, and you just go, and, uh, and that's a great thing, and it's my job to try and get the listeners, you know, to come along with us on the journey. So Awesome. Well, I'm more than happy to clear anything up that uh, doesn't seem as clear, so feel free. Beautiful, but, uh, and, 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 I, and it's, it's fascinating stuff, and I, I really want to hear more. Thank you. So what I really want to hammer home with the aerobic energy system is its ability to help you recover outside of the gym. So uh, when I talk about autonomic balance, a great way to think about it is heart rate, how aerobic athletes and runners and all these people are noted for having great heart health because of their low resting heart rates. And what that shows is they have a great amount of parasympathetic, parasympathetic tone on the heart, which in turn – means they have a much greater capacity to get sympathetic for their sport as well. So what happens in strength athletes is they're in a state of being constantly sympathetic. And like I mentioned before, if you're in a constant state of breaking down, then when it comes time that, like, you're stepping under the bar or up to the bar for a very big lift, if you're constantly in a state of breaking down, you've ultimately broken down more energy than you needed to. So now that you're under the bar, you have less to use. That's something that uh, is noted in a lot of strength athletes and a lot of literature that they do have less or more suboptimal autonomic balance. Um, measurements like heart rate variability through bioforce and omega wave and all these great ways are uh, great quantitative measures to use to determine your autonomic balance. But uh, that's not exactly what I'm here to talk about. I'll give you some examples and expand a little more on how exactly the aerobic energy system can do that. First, actually, I want to relate to you why it's important. When you're training elactically, when you're doing very heavy lifts, that energy system is utilized only for the lift. So what you're doing after the lift is recovering, and that is done by the aerobic energy system if you're lucky. If you can recover aerobically as a strength athlete, that means you're efficient enough 
to come back to baseline level very quickly and not utilize that extra glucose from being too sympathetic. So not only is there an improvement in your recovery day to day, it's also set to set. And that's a very real way on how it happens. An inefficient way that I see many lifters lifting is they're sympathetic and they're freaking out and they're very intense during their rest time. Well, I mean, you're kind of just eating up with some glucose. And I'm not saying that, like, eating up at a little bit of glucose is detrimental, but set after set, day after day, if you're training uh, with, uh, I don't want to say blind intensity, but blind intensity, uh, you're, are waste, you're wasting something. And this game is about pounds and numbers, so you don't want to be too wasteful. And uh, that just means to train with intent. Like, if you don't need to be overly jacked up for a set, don't get overly jacked up for a set. Sorry for ranting. That's here nor there. No, so no, no. What that's, the goal that's, that's, actually, um, <laughs> that's actually extremely valid. And, and interestingly, something I like to point out is how a lot of these things just seem to um, just be inherently true. And, and something you hear a lot from Eastern European coaches is that weight room workouts, non-training hall, non-contest platform lifts, should be done with a very low state of arousal. They, they really feel that training is just that. It's the repetitive action. It's not a frenzied fervor contest. Uh, and, and as much as I dislike the West Side crowd, Louis Simmons often says that, is that workouts should be done with very low psych. Low psych is his term for low arousal, um, meaning that, you know, it, it shouldn't be a frenzy. You should, you know, I guess, as you're saying, conserve energy uh, that, that doesn't need to be otherwise spent. So so I, I, I think that that... That idea has been said many times just in non-technical terms by many, quote, gurus and, and, and trainer, trainees, uh, and they probably don't even know why they're saying it, and, and you're telling them. So so continue. Absolutely. And I'm glad you actually bring that up because that's a smooth transition to my next point. So now that I have your brain thinking about how being maybe too sympathetic or being sympathetic too often can be a bad thing, uh, I want to transition into how this is going to affect you across the week and uh, how the relationship between your autonomic nervous system can affect how much you're really uh, handling volume-wise across the week. So the first thing I want to talk about is how being more parasympathetic at the right times can benefit you. This is largely in part and controlled by, excuse me, nutrition. And okay. that's something that a lot of people need to take into better consideration. Better nutrition will allow for better recovery. And like we said earlier, more frequent training sessions will really allow you to have better adaptations. When you want to recover more, you have to, you can recover more two ways. You can actively take in more food, you can sleep more, but you can also reduce training stress and that would still give you a differential to recover more. And this is where training aerobically as a strength athlete can really help you out. So you'll be recovering better set to set, uh, training session to training session, but you'll also be damaging less, if that makes sense, because there is a clear-cut difference. So, for example, if you're really deconditioned, a 4 by 3 at 80%, which is decent volume, but nothing outrageous is probably pretty tough. But if, for, if you were more efficient and you recovered better set to set, you could probably get maybe five or six set to three with the same level of fatigue on the day. So my next point would be how do you actually train aerobically without taking a lot out of you? Because everyone knows, like has been under the impression that too much cardio can hurt you, and in fact can. Uh, uh, an adaptation to low-intensity aerobic exercise it is or are decreased levels of plasma leucine. And everyone knows the importance of leucine and its ability to stimulate protein synthesis and all that good stuff, but that is a direct adaptation. If you think about highly aerobic athletes, none of them are huge. Why? Because it's harder. They have skinny calves and lower limbs because it's less weight that needs to swing in pendulum for the stride. And ultimately, that makes a more efficient runner. 
Right, that's so. just simply the organism adapting to the demands of the activity. Um, running with a refrigerator on your back is far more difficult than, you know, running naturally, and the smaller you are, the easier it is to run. So it's that that's, you know, very clear, and you're saying that a lot of that is simply because of energy pathways and possibly leucine depletion. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, all those things react intermolecularly in that, like, people need to really understand is that nothing is a one-step process. So when that, that <laughs> point right there, folks, if there was, if, 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 when I write a book, that's going to be the title, boys and girls, <laughs> nothing happens in one step. This stuff yeah. is enormous cascades beginning from the incredibly benign unnoticed all the way up to the cataclysmic train wreck is all initiated in tiny little steps. Tiny, tiny Absolutely. Little so, like, you're not necessarily that accurate when you say leucine makes muscle. Like, it, it kind of does in a way, but not directly at all. So that's why there's a lot of flaws in advertisement and stuff, but that's not what I want to get into. The way I integrate aerobic training into my training template, which is how I can speak for its efficacy directly because this is the only template I've used in recent years. So it's very simple. Uh, the skeleton is just a movement prep, resistance training, and accessory assistance work. So nothing special there. But what is different than what most people do is I program all of my aerobic work and my specific work capacity work, which would be your plyos, your med ball tosses, things like that, into my movement prep. So there is a mild pre-exhaust, pre-fatigue uh, factor that plays in which I actually don't mind. I actually like it better because performing lifts under more fatigue essentially will give you a bigger peak uh, with the type of periodization I use. I fo uh, heavily follow block periodization, and for those who are familiar with it, it's one of those brutal types of high fatigue things. And then, uh, well, I feel, almost feel bad saying that as an oversimplification, but... Uh, you work really, really hard, and then when you step on the platform, you PR your squat by 50 pounds. That's, right, uh, and, and I'll, just, I'll just interject here. I'm assuming that anyone taking the time to listen to my podcast and my radio show would have a pretty solid understanding of block periodization. Um, but, and, and, and I also will point out that everyone I interview, this comes up. This seems to be kind of the bedrock of what every successful person out there is doing in the world of training and programming. But block periodization is just a simple concept of taking blocks of time, a temporal unit, this month, two months, three months, so many, some people measure it in weeks, some people measure it in workouts, but it's a matter of from this date to this date, that's a block, and I'm going to do something rather specific during that time, and then I will transition into a different block and a different block culminating in a goal. It's simple periodization. The block part is because it's segmented into relatively uniform time frames. So I just want to throw that out there in case someone doesn't immediately grasp block periodization, but um, if you have any intention of being a successful weight trainee and strength athlete, you better get with the program, literally. <laughs> so, Great so word of advice for anyone that wasn't familiar with it. Yeah, that's I, and I hope that there's no one out there that isn't. I hope I'm talking to the ether. I sincerely do. <laughs> so, so please, um, you, you know, continue with the with it, with this block concept and 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 basically how you lay it out and structure it and and why. Okay, thank you. So um, first I'll attack the movement prep, like I was saying. So when you whenever you talk to anyone, movement prep I use in exchange for the word warm up. I think it's a poor word. Uh, I don't want to get into it. But movement prep is essentially my warm up. So what are the goals of the warm up? And please do not think raise the heart rate. It's going to happen anyway. You already know why. The really, the biggest goal is to prepare the athlete skeletally and neurally to lift. Other ones include injury prevention, holistic movements, and like things like that. So you, you get the idea. But here is where I program my aerobic work for two reasons. The first being that it kind of acts as a buffer for the day. And what I mean by that is if you come in really, really feeling like crap and you put yourself through a holistic movement, 30-minute aerobic-type warm-up, 
you're probably going to end up feeling pretty good. Those are the same endorphins that I released uh, after light cardio session. That's why everyone leaves the gym feeling great. So when I say it acts as a buffer, it really uh, eliminates the problem of under arousal for training, which people in the strength world understand happens. We are all masters of monotony, and that's how you become proficient in the sport. So anyone who says they're passionate and uh, super fired up for every session is lying to you because monotony is not that. It's literally the exact opposite. So it acts as a buffer for under arousal, but it also really preps the lifter neurally to lift heavy or lift elastically phosphor with their phosphogen system because that's what we do. That's really the meat and potatoes in the programming for a strength athlete. So this aerobic work at first is going to be fatiguing. I have a lot of athletes that hate me for programming it for them, but it's very effective. It allows you to handle more volume, as I said, but the injury prevention aspect of it is very profound because it allows you to recover better uh, and let the body – this is another gross oversimplification I uh, hate saying – but focus on recovering the joints and the musculature and growth because the body does have a hierarchy of needs. If there is a massive amount of structural damage only uh, with a little bit of cartilaginous damage to coincide with it, the bigger stressor is going to take the priority. So things can get left out is what I'm saying. It doesn't okay. happen exactly like that, but it, it happens. Okay. I have some, I have some questions. Um, and you've done, you've done a very good job of explaining that. I, I follow you completely, and I suspect that most of the listeners will as well. But I, I, I kind of in a devil's advocate kind of aspect, I want to I want to ask some questions to to point or, or to to date in the conversation. Um, so you're, you're you're saying basically the gist of this is that um, general fitness is kind of the 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 poor synonym for the aerobic capacity, which you're you're talking about. So you're saying that general fitness in, will improve athletic performance, and a good way to get that is to apply that stressor before the weight training, strength training, or the you know the, the shorter shorter action energy systems. I can certainly see how you know that would allow, as you said, it is a bad word, but a, that would allow a much greater warm up and a longer um, focus period. I find sometimes that from people walking in the gym to walking under the squat bar, there's not enough transitional period. There's not nearly enough time to get one's psyche and, and, and skill levels and everything focused into that time. So a, a protracted warm-up, if you will, uh, could certainly clear that problem up. Um, now, question I have, being the technical geek, do, what metric are you using to measure this as saying, well, it definitely is aerobic. It's going to be, you know, fitness improving. What what metric is, are you using? A heart rate or just a general duration or just the general concept of, yes, you are working hard. And then after that, my question would be, knowing how the Krebs cycle, the acetic acid cycle, and the electron transfer system and all those things work, um, is it possible – that some of the metabolites of low intensity aerobic work could actually fuel the glycotic system. Absolutely. So uh, you have two really good points there that make a lot of sense. So what I do want to remind everyone is we're talking about the aerobic system of strength athlete, which has very different needs uh, than other athletes. So uh, from a I'm sorry, let me gather my words. So from a metabolite stance, small amounts of uh, metabolic waste building up in the blood stimulate what's called vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, You do notice the growth word in there. It is a downstream protein that is related to growth hormone, growth hormone increases and changes in the hormone itself. So by stimulating that, you begin cascades that bring other ligands and peptide proteins and things of that sort to the table that are advantageous to training. This is going to include 
uh, IGF-1, and all those peptide uh, proteins and ligands that are present and shown to improve performance. So that so is on that genuine anabolic uh, stimuli downstream, uh, clearly, but genuine anabolic and performance-aiding uh, downstream contributors can be brought to work by literally a catabolic activity. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, there's lots of loops like that in the body. So really quick uh, fact, the reason that uh, there is a window of nutrient timing for training is because of something, a mechanism that activates the GLU4 transporter during training. This was shown in diabetics who after strength-based resistance training actually were able to uptake glucose into their cells without the need of uh, exogenous insulin, if I remember correctly. Yes, but, uh, that, glucose is definitely a, uh, a surface translocator is the technical absolutely. term. <laughs> there are multiple loops in the human body that do act like that, uh, especially with strength-based resistance training. How you measure and objectively quantify the amount of work and how you're reacting to the amount of this aerobic work in your movement prep is, again, by looking at the needs of the, the strength need or uh, the aerobic needs of the strength athlete. But the way you want to train it is more, the lens you look through to train it, rather, is more of your gauge of progress. So we're going to be training aerobically smear, like solely for the purpose of improving recovery and volume. So that means there's a relatively low need for work capacity. Now, this can vary to different levels, different times of the year, and even athlete to athlete. But there's not an extremely high need. So the work and the adaptation you're looking for for the strength athlete aerobically can really be done with an amount of volume and intensity that really is your warm-up or your movement prep, for lack of a better term. So essentially, you're going to always be working in the same amount of volume. It's going to become easy, and that's when you uh, know that your aerobic energy system is in a place that is highly functioning for your sport, and at that point, we're only seeking maintenance adaptation. Obviously, there's different needs and different times of year and exceptions to the rule, but that's essentially what it is. So to give a realistic example, uh, I used kettlebell tempos with myself and one other athlete who didn't have access to a great gym facility at the time. And it's okay. a very simple setup. Uh, we used a 24 kilo kettlebell for swings, which is, as everyone understands, who knows kilo math, it's pretty light. So what we did was, it was eight reps, rest 20 seconds. Eight reps, rest 20 seconds. That was considered one rep. And the protocol was three sets of two reps. So I found this method or this way to quantify the kettlebell tempo after using uh, Prowler and Charlie Francis style tempos for a long time. So based on doing both, I can tell you that it's a similar uh, need for work capacity to be able to compile those two. So that's I why I, was, to, I do want to interrupt you there just because I need a grinectomy. Um, I'm grinning like a complete jackass because I don't <laughs> hear Charlie Francis's name nearly enough. He is the guy that literally opened the world to true fuck Louis Simmons and a bunch of those dimwits. Charlie Francis is the guy who elucidated what speed in relative to strength is and why it's important. And uh, I just don't hear his name enough. And I, 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 even if the show runs over, I have to say that over and over out loud, Charlie Francis uh, unfortunately died a few years ago of cancer, but he was the guy that put speed in speed strength. So there you go, please. Absolutely. And uh, like, uh, rest in peace, Charlie Francis, I have to attribute a lot of my perspective and what I used to program successfully to Charlie Francis because it wasn't just speed. It was his refreshing perspective and objective perspective on how to look at sports, sports performance programming, and how to really uh, attack and achieve the adaptation that you're looking for with minimal stress because at the very high level, it's not the lack of strength that inhibits people from winning. It's injury for the most part, especially in strength sports. So if you could get more out of less, I just don't understand why you wouldn't. 
that's absolutely, I do attribute Charlie Francis giving me my appreciation for the aerobic energy system as well. For all the Charlie Francis fans out there, you know where to go for reading. And then uh, the, one of the last tips, points I wanted to get to, relating everything together. So how to balance the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and how to take a little more control of it in your daily activities and nutrition and everything uh, to ultimately make your training better and ultimately allow you to handle more volume, hopefully getting you stronger. So the first thing I want uh, everyone to understand is androgens, exogenous or endogenous, are going to create a more sympathetic human. That is fact, whether you're using testosterone exogenously or you're a really high natural test type of person, androgens do create a more sympathetic nervous system. So for people that uh, fall into that category, you need to understand that. And while it is improving uh, your performance in every aspect, I will not say it doesn't, your work capacity, uh, your ability to produce force and all those things, you do have to take that into account when looking at your training week, uh, your recovery needs, and everything like that. So let's just use an athlete who does use it exogenously as an example. You have to understand that the stress that you put your body under for hitting that PR, even if it's in training, is great. And you have to understand that downstream when programming and when putting your meat prep together or your competition prep together, that it will catch up to you. Because although drugs have revolutionized performance for the better, uh, it doesn't make you superhuman. Right. You so can it's still the same still, organism underneath. Exactly. You can still experience high amounts of residual fatigue. If not, I mean, I'll even go as far as saying that you can probably experience more residual fatigue if you're a performance-enhancing drug user. So Ironically, that is something. That, that is exactly my argument is that is the problem is drug use, and, and I'm per, per, personally very guilty of this, drug use has escalated to the point where you can train at such a level, you are literally self-destructive. Absolutely. And I hope that I was able to express myself clearly enough that that should make you think there's even more efficacy to integrating some type of aerobic or holistic movement-based uh, movement prep to your training because since you can already recover better, why not give yourself another leg up? Now, um, I, ha I have it, some questions. Um, I, I'm going to use some different language just, again, to, to kind of homogenize for the people listening. Um, where you're saying movement patterns, you're literally talking about muscular systems. You know, the chest and shoulders would be the, the, the you know, pattern of a bench press, and the glutes and hamstrings and quads would be the pattern of a squat or deadlift. Now, when you do these movement patterns for your expanded quasi-aerobic warm-up, are they specific to the muscle groups in, in question, or does it matter? Could I do medicine ball throws with my chest and shoulders to warm up for my squat, or is it necessary metabolically that they be of like muscle group? Must there be a homogeny, or is it just a metabolic issue and it doesn't really matter? Well, unfortunately, just like all programming questions, the answer is yes and no. Of course, <laughs> there can't be a straight answer. In programming, it really comes down to can you defend your case? Honestly, you can take something that's seemingly idiotic, but if to the person that programmed it, they have a reason, and that reason is in line with their long-term plan, you can't really say no. Of course, the answer is yes and no. But I'll give an example of how I program and how it changes this movement prep throughout uh, training blocks and training goals. So okay. currently, I am in... Uh, transition to the, my second block of a 15-week training cycle. So I'm still relatively new, and my movement prep is still very generalized. So, for example, I had a bodyweight medley, which includes, included a reverse grip push-up, a neutral grip pull-up, a kettlebell single leg RDL, and a single leg box squat. Is that necessarily specific to what I was training that day? I mean, yeah, I did kind of everything, and I squatted that day. Yes and no. At that point, I think it's healthy for the athlete to get out of their specific movement patterns often, especially farther away from the competition. Because 
Injury does come with monotony as well. If you only squat, bench, and deadlift every single day for a year, you're more likely to get hurt because of the frequency. But if your shoulders and your hips are able to do single leg work, are able to translate through space uh, more stably, are able to do different things and are experiencing different ranges of motion, then your body is going to have a more complete musculature to support you because Squatting, benching, and deadlifting, if you're doing it for max weight, it's a compensatory pattern. So there are certain muscles being overactive to make the lift better, certain probably under, and things like that. So but late, uh, earlier in your training cycle, by including various types of movements, Turkish get-ups are a personal favorite, anything like that, you're really doing yourself a justice by creating other movement patterns that are effective and efficient as well and ultimately, that's also how it can help you stay injury-free. Um, I hope that makes sense. It does, and, and, and as something I spoke with on my last guest, uh, Patrick Castelli, is so much of this stuff just seems to, no matter what the person's perspective or origin, when, when you start to really talk to successful people, the same fundamental ideas keep shaking out. They're just immutable and unavoidable. And that's one of them. Um, I had a lot of exposure to Eastern European uh, sports science, and they would always, always, always talk about body awareness and general fitness, uh, how they pressed athletes, um, you know, Olympic caliber weightlifters. They, they pushed into martial arts simply to help broaden their motor patterns, broaden their, their, their uh, proprioception, and broaden their general fitness. The more things you're good at, the less gaps there are and the less vulnerable you are. And I, that seems to be what I'm hearing from you just in different language, and, and, it, and it's wonderful. Um, I, I'm just very fascinated about the contiguous nature of thinking from very different points of view. Absolutely. Like, if you still think that training is about the muscles, then you miss the boat because it's about the brain. Uh, how do you think these skinny little dudes – at like the 69 kilo weight class in lifting are putting 400 pounds overhead with like next to no muscle mass, consider, like for what we consider muscle mass as strength athletes. You know what I mean? So um, there's certainly something to be said for the brain doing a much larger part of the lifting than the muscles. Um, something I wanted to cover because everyone knows about the sympathetic drugs. Everyone knows about caffeine and all these other drugs that can be prepared to train and things like that. A parasympathetic drug that is prevalent in the community that also has a negative connotation I want to address is insulin. Now, I'm not saying that insulin is something that everyone should go inject because it will help the recovery. I'm saying if you fit the population of insulin, if I could stick in here a, a point, um, you, you know, just to dumb the language down to such a level, um, everything you spoke about in the, the arousal side is, you know, if you want to use bro science words, they're catabolic. That's all breaking mm -hmm. something down, making it available to spend on the short term. And now you're looking at the opposite side. It's the anabolic or repair and replenish side. Insulin is highly reparative, restorative. That's what its job is, is there's food now, eat it and save it. And so just, you know, kind of taking such high-minded science and dumbing it down to the, the bro level is this is the mirror of that. This is the anabolic side of things, correct? Yes, absolutely. And going back to what I said, how I can't really say insulin shuttles nutrients to lean tissue, it's because technically it's only anabolic to fat tissue, meaning <laughs> it doesn't actually uh, create an anabolic response in the muscle cell. It's anti-catabolic, which is a different story. But just to debunk that common myth, uh, that is the facts on insulin. So why is it still... The combination of glut 4 upregulation via exercise and insulin can, in fact, be a pro-anabolic issue, but that's molecular chemistry that we <laughs> don't nearly have the time to tackle. Exactly. Essentially, in the simplest terms, view insulin as an opportunity for the muscle cells to take it one step further. Uh, using insulin will, will help shuttle more glucose and more nutrients to the cells, but something still has to happen once they're there. Imagine it as encouraging the use. 
So the reason this is great is because, like I explained earlier, there is a priority list on the body of what gets the, what needs repair and what needs to be dealt with. So with more insulin and giving more opportunities to multiple different tissues to repair is what's ultimately going to lead better recovery. So this is also going to help you recover, like I was talking about, parasympathetically outside of training as well as within training. There, that's the efficacy for using insulin. More volume. And as you, you know, very astutely and very, very appropriately mentioned, this is all cascade. Every action is connected. And there is some research out there that suggests that parasympathetic nature of insulin is continued on downstream into other peptides and other, uh, you know, uh, neurological uh, mediators. You know, not only is it in and of itself kind of restorative slash anabolic, but it can, it may possibly initiate downstream effects, improving sleep and, and all sorts of other things. You know, there seems to be a choline connection many, many stages down the road. So it, it's basically is the mirror of all the bad stuff you've been doing through your waking hours. Absolutely. So now the last thing I want to talk about with insulin is the population. Uh, okay. I am not by any means recommending that everyone goes and buys insulin at their local Walmart and just start injecting it right away. The, you have to understand there are potential negative repercussions as well, including obviously everyone knows about going hypo, but if you're a dedicated athlete, you should be on some type of meal regimen, which that in and of itself should solve the hypo problem. The other repercussions I wanted to make note of were there are potential long-term effects of insulin abuse, i.e. using it seven days a week, too high of a dose, exceeding, I'd say, I don't know, like in the 30s, the 50s I use a day. Those are doses that are less commonly played with and understood. So that is a gray area where there is potential that damage that exists. you can run into. That definitely exists in the bodybuilding world. I've, I've seen those numbers and much higher. And, and yeah, there is definitely uh, wild, wild alterations to blood lipid profile and possibly even atherosclerosis issues. But that's really not where you're at here. And I also would like to interject. Generally, athletes, particularly strength athletes, have very high calorie load diets. So you're, you are talking about an elevated insulin level, whether it's exogenous or not. Absolutely. You know, insulin is a direct response to carbohydrate load. You know, people want to go on and on about simple versus complex. And the reality is X amount of carbohydrates typically generates Y amount of insulin response, regardless of variety. Absolutely. As long as you're eating the carbs, there's going to be some activity of insulin in the body. And just because you inject something doesn't make it bad, but oftentimes injecting something does highlight what can be bad because you're exceeding super physiological levels. Now, that's not to say that you can't have bad effects not injecting insulin. Look at type 2 diabetes that's sweeping our country. Uh, those people don't inject type, uh, they don't inject insulin until it's too late, but they still have very serious insulin-related problems. So, no matter what, whether it's injecting or not injecting, there are always things that you have to look out for. And uh, acutely, there are some positives, which is uh, seemingly ironic when talking about with insulin. People have uh, anecdotally been able to see improved blood glucose levels even after the cessation of insulin use, as well as an increase in natural testosterone via decreasing binding of proteins uh, like albumin and sex hormone binding globulin. So there is a positive side to it as well. But, uh, Which as just the, further correlates the interconnectedness. Literally eating a piece of pie can impact your insulin levels and your body fat levels, but it can also possibly affect your circulating androgen levels, which is fascinating and far too complicated to speak here, but it is definitely relevant to people understand how connected this stuff is. Absolutely. Please don't ever think that anything in the human body is isolated. At the end of the day, you're one organism with billions and billions of parts of you, but they still ultimately are interconnected somehow, some way. The last thing I wanted to cover as far as uh, supplementation went are antioxidants, rhodiola, and other stress reducers. So now, the first thing I want to say is training is a stress, is program stress. You're programming a specific type of 
high stress to the body to elicit X adaptation. If you understand that training is a stressful process, then you then can infer that the stress somehow does a good thing. And that is true. So stress is a good and a bad thing. You have to pick and choose when you want to reduce it. So the first thing I wanted to attack was antioxidants and things like that, uh, stress-reducing, anti-free radical, anti-metabolic waste, of that nature post-training might not be your best bet because in a way that's undoing the stress you just imposed on yourself. Uh, if you program so intelligently, uh, like I said, being able to defend everything you do, then every exercise, every rep has a reason, and you should know downstream that that reason is an adaptation you're trying to elicit. Even if it's as simple as, I want bigger biceps, so I'm going to do two extra sets. But that's still an added stress you're imposing for a long-term adaptation. That's so, so refreshing to hear. Um, I, I actually had that very conversation uh, with with one of my clients not long ago is I had programmed they were a bodybuilder physique athlete and I programmed them to do a certain amount of you know quote cardio I hate the word but we'll use it and aerobic activity for the purpose of burning energy and hopefully fat that's that's what I call that and they wanted desperately to do some sort of post workout administration of some sort of a shake or some sort of something and I I couldn't get through to them that that would undo what they just did. The purpose of the activity was to put oneself in a deficit. Well, if that's the goal, then you can't replenish the deficit or you just wasted a bunch of time. Absolutely. So that's the first thing I want people to think about when they're picking up this type of anti-stress phosphatidylserine, all of those types of supplements that decrease stress and decrease cortisol. Cortisol's not a bad guy. Like, he's one of the driving glucocorticoids in you getting energy for training. All of these are important. Like, higher cortisol levels post-training mean higher recovery post-training downstream. So by inhibiting these things, you really might be doing yourself more harm than good. So that's one way to look at it, where conversely, I actually uh, recommend rhodiola rosea as a supplement to a lot of people because it does reduce stress as well. It's an activator of the parasympathetic nervous system because of multiple different mechanisms. So if you can accurately depict when there's a time where you want to try to lower stress, then that would be the proper time for an antioxidant uh, supplement and of that sort I, that I was referring I, to. The language I use to intimate that very concept, and I, and I have a very similar concept in my programming, is I consider that and, say, ZMA and... Um, even green tea, as ridiculous as that sounds, it's, a, it's easy mm-hmm. to see as it's actually a valid drug. Dealing with non, you know, PhD caliber people, I consider I just put them under the blanket heading of depressants. All day long has been a, an, a, an arousal stimulant, and now we're going to apply depressant compounds to bring you down. Absolutely, that's essentially what I'm getting at. The three supplements I mentioned, or drug interactions, whatever you want to call it the androgen, the insulin, and the stress-reducing are all highly effective methods of intervening with everyday physiology to improve your performance if you know how to use it adequately. And that doesn't mean taking more. That means understanding its purpose and programming it as a part of your program. Your program isn't just your training. It's the other 23 hours of the day. It's everything else that can get you to train better, train harder, train longer. So my biggest takeaways for the day as I begin to conclude all of this are that it's not just what you do in the gym. It's outside. It's all the interactions around the gym as well. All of this really comes down to being a long-term planner. What I mentioned about the aerobic work and programming everything for an energy system and for a reason isn't necessarily the way to increase performance acutely as best as possible. Because what we are aiming for with that type of training, implementing aerobic work, is downstream work capacity to handle more volume. So just in that aspect, you're looking at anywhere from four to ten weeks where you're going to be working towards something that isn't necessarily a competition. So you have to be a long-term planner when you look at all these things because it will help you in the future but you're not necessarily looking for a conference. The final thing I really wanted to tie home for everyone was it's all a balance. 
uh, like I said, you have to know when to train uh, excessively hard, really push the bill on that optimal arousal stuff. You really also have to know when to back it off. If you look at it through an autonomic lens like I do, then it'll also it'll give you a much easier uh, way to objectify what you should do uh, in the future. So if you know, based on HRV or whatever other measure you want to use, that you're overly sympathetic on any given day, then you might want to rethink doing an active recovery session. As well as that may uh, be beneficial for the aerobic work, if you're really overly sympathetic, the last thing you want to do is drive it home even more because that means you don't have the parasympathetic balance to recover. So on that night where you're overly sympathetic, it might be better to get some extra sleep or eat some extra food. So be objective in realizing where you are in that yin and yang balance. That is how you, I want you to be picking what you do and why. It's not just because you feel something. You have to objectively look at yourself on this scale of balancing between sympathetic and parasympathetic, between hard work and recovery, and between this energy system and that energy system, that you're always somewhere in the balance. You're never perfect. So you have to really look at where you are and why you're there and how you got there before you choose how to fix it. And that really does apply to injuries, training, and anything outside that. All right. I am – that is um, – it, it's really fascinating. Uh, a lot of existing kind of long-term ideas there that you uh, kind of come on yourself and then phrase differently and, and created a, a, a package, a paradigm that I don't think existed previously <laughs> – but there's an awful lot of existing material in there that, that you've encompassed, and I'm, I'm really excited about this, and I really think it's something that we probably would need to talk to about even again even more later. But I do have a couple of questions, and I, I kind of wanted to keep them till the end here and just kind of do it in bullet points. One is if somebody tried to implement your kind of expanded, almost aerobic-style warm-up, how much short-term decrement, how much will it hurt them initially in terms of performance in the core movement that they're going to do that day and how quickly will that decrement fade or or is there even a decrement am i am i creating something that doesn't even exist uh that will depend largely on a training age and b i hate the word conditioning but their current work capacity state if you're someone who's deconditioned then you may see a decrement I have maybe seen a decrement in performance with two athletes that I can think of off the top of my head, and they fell into the A, training age, and B, deconditioned category. Um, the first one, obviously I'm not going to use any names because confidentiality is very important when working with people, but um, he's on the older side, and he had only been training in the strength world for, a, I think it was over a year. So he had already began to develop these bad habits but didn't have much adaptation to fall back on. And his decrement was not in intensity. It was just in volume, uh, ability to handle volume. So after the warm-up, he would just always fall two, three sets short. But that isn't anything that I would personally count as a decrement in performance because if you're in bad enough shape that I do intend for all this aerobic work to be very submaximal. If you're in bad enough shape that something that submaximal gives you a decrement in performance, then something leads me to believe that you weren't hitting a lot of volume to begin with. So there's that first. Um, so it's so it's a very self-limiting system. Is that it, you know, if it harms you, it, it's harming you. If it's harming your performance, it's because you desperately need this aspect. Absolutely, and that's your biggest flaw. And the best way to implement it is honestly. The nice thing about being a strength athlete is there's a lot of variety that you can use for your aerobic work because the requirement is relatively low. So you can recruit something where, uh, like a prowler, where you can go a tw uh, 20-yard run, like not a sprint, but 80% of your speed, take 30 seconds rest, push it back, and aim for a total of like 6 to 10 reps there, 10 being where you're really peaking, your work capacity, and six being where you're really developing it, and especially if you're on that lower end. I think using this Fowler example, because that's how I typically, uh, it's a very common way that I program it, 
if you're anywhere under the five to six reps bell curve, where if anything like five to six reps decreases performance or significantly fatigues you, then you're being severely inhibited performance-wise because of this lack of aerobic uh, capacity. And then uh, that's a completely valid metric. That's what people need to take home from this: is that you know, so, if you can't do that, and we're talking, what is that? A, a grand total of probably ten minutes. I mean, that's not a, a vast amount of work. You know, that, no, yeah, if anything, it's less than that, but like. Unfortunately, it's more common than a lot of people think. Even if they think they're in good shape, a lot of times they're not. And, like, it's not that you need to be in great aerobic shape to do a powerlifting meet. Like, by no means do you need to. But you need to have enough aerobic capacity to recover quickly between attempts and then to also handle more volume to get you stronger for the platform. Like, if you're only using the amount of aerobic capacity you need on powerlifting game day – then what are you going to hit in training? Ten reps? Like, I, I, I agree entirely. So, so you're not going to be hitting ten reps at ninety percent. I'll guarantee that. So, you know, to, to to start bringing this to a conclusion and a summation, your your basic premises, you know, the, the complicated hierarchies of energy systems and all of that can be somewhat dumbed down. And I do apologize for dumbing it down because I, I I know that you're anything but, and you're about anything but. <laughs> but but to 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 kind of dumb it down into just bullet point summation is an expanded kind of inter- interval type warm up can e- both improve your overall conditioning your overall fitness therefore i e your overall work capacity as well as upregulate enzymatic and metabolic under the hood stuff that can improve your actual sports performance specific energy system, in this case the glycotic system, and even possibly the electron transfer system. So it's basically improving your fitness and improving your ability to generate work capacity in your sport-specific realm. Absolutely. That's absolutely what I'm saying. And, like, I love the word enzymatic process because in case people weren't fully aware, enzymatic processes are the exact reason you can even contract your muscle fibers in the first place. So the phosphagen system that you're using to train is quite literally an enzyme away. So if you're doing a movement prep that facilitates the presence of uh, those necessary enzymes during and after the lift or the, the workout or the movement prep, rather, sorry, by the time you touch that barbell to get underneath the uh, to squat, you're going to be much more prepared to produce high amounts of force and to contract hard for your work sets. And you're, you really are going to feel better. Like, if you're getting under a squat bar totally cold with no enzymes working, you're simply not going to produce as much force. So, so there you have it, folks. You know, we're, we're talking about improving your overall health, your overall fitness, and allowing that to improve your overall performance in your sport-specific endeavor. Uh, as well as prevent injury or at least stave off injury. I never say prevent injury because that's impossible. That's absolute silliness. If you're training really hard, you're going to get hurt. The goal is to get as hurt as little as possible, as infrequently as possible. That's just fascinating stuff. It's enormous. I'd really like to spend some time talking with you in the future about some specific recovery-minded actions and attitudes. I think that in itself could be an enormous show, just talking about how to – everybody knows how to train hard, or at least they think they do, but I think very few people know what to do after that. And I think that in itself could be an enormously valuable conversation. But um, what what you've said here is just fascinating. Um, I think there's a lot we could additionally touch on. For instance, um, how to modulate that through the season Uh, is the same – you know, that kind of maintenance level should that – change as competition nears or should it, you know, escalate or, or, or de-escalate in, in different blocks and times, that sort of thing. But I think we're going to leave that for people to contact you individually and ask that sort of stuff. One, because we don't want to give away the ranch, and two, because we could talk about it forever, and I certainly could. But I, I, think, yeah, that, absolutely. I think that pretty much brings us to a, to a, a, a closing point that, you know, people really need to think about what they're doing, how the body derives the energy to do that, and how just general overall fitness can improve that.
Uh, I think that in itself is enough take home. Uh, and, you know, we talked about you know, people should really go back and re-listen to this. We talked about some of the metrics that you can use to measure that and how you can get there. And, of course, something that I don't think enough hosts talk about is you also can contact this gentleman and talk about this stuff on a one-on-one level. Um, you know, he, as well as I, do this stuff for a living. So, um, you know, this is a vast outlet of free information, but there's still much more on tap, folks. So, Andrew, anything you'd like to add to that? Anything you want to just stuff in there on what's already been an incredibly packed episode? Uh, I just want everyone to know that there is much, much more to it. Like, like B said, uh, there's absolutely a way to program peak, deep, like, uh, deload everything throughout the training process. And, like, there's always more of the story. So, if you find something interesting, absolutely chase it down until you fully understand it to a satisfying point because as much as I've I've read, it's only been because I'm truly intrigued and interested in why. And the day I read a book or an article and it's about human performance and I don't think it's interesting, I guarantee I won't be as active, but I don't think that'll ever happen. So I'm with you. I'm with you. There's never a day when I don't read something and ask 10 whys. That's the whole that's the whole purpose folks by the way that's the whole purpose of knowledge is not to make you feel like you know the answers it's to make you feel like you know new questions that's the purpose if 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 you quote learn something and it doesn't make you ask three new questions you didn't actually learn something Couldn't say it better myself I really appreciate being on the show B uh it was a great experience and I hope it continues to be successful for you I, you know, I think with guests like yourself, there's no way we can't be successful, and I sincerely hope that people pay attention to you, uh, that they contact you, that they follow you. We'll put all of that information in the summation of this video and uh, the, the uh, podcast page. I sincerely hope that this opens people's eyes to the value of energetics, energy systems, cellular energetics, and most importantly, how that all re- revolves into or should recovery. So, wow. I'm going to run through this and probably listen to this show myself ten more times. So I think that's about all we can say on the topic for now, and uh, I think it's a great place to sign off. Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure. As, like, Thank you so much, B. It really has for me as well. I'll talk to you soon.